TCP and UDP are the primary protocols used to transport data across the internet. These protocols sit at the transport layer, and if you need a refresher on that, you can click on the link in the description. While both protocols handle data transmission very differently, there are some similarities. And in this video, we're going to explore the attributes that make these protocols similar yet different. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, and it's the transport layer protocol often used by time-sensitive applications that cannot tolerate delay. Typically, you'll see this used in voice and video applications. The source port specifies the port number of the sending application or process, and it allows the receiving host to identify the application or service that generated the UDP datagram. The destination port identifies the port number of the receiving application or process and helps the receiving host determine which application or service should receive the UDP datagram. The length header specifies the total length of the UDP datagram, including the header and data in bytes, and it enables the receiver to determine the size of the incoming datagram so that it can extract the data accurately. The checksum header detects errors in the UDP datagram during transmission, and it provides a mechanism to verify the integrity of the datagram, ensuring that it hasn't been corrupted during transmission. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and it works best with a constant stream of data from an upper layer protocol. The source port identifies the port number of the sending application or process, and it lets the receiving host know which application or service the TCP segment is associated with. The destination port identifies the port number of the receiving application or process, and this helps the receiving host determine which application or service should receive the TCP segment. The sequence number identifies the byte number of the first data byte in the TCP segment, and this allows the receiving host to reconstruct the data stream in the correct order. The acknowledgement number indicates the next expected byte that the receiver of the TCP segment is anticipating, and it acknowledges the receipt of previous data and helps maintain reliable data transmission. The header length specifies the length of the TCP header in 32-bit words and determines the starting point of the data within the TCP segment. The reserved header is reserved for future use and it must be set to zero. This ensures compatibility and potential future extensions to the TCP protocol. The flags header provides essential control and signaling functions within the TCP protocol, and it allows for the establishment, maintenance, and termination of connections while ensuring reliable and orderly data transmission. The urgent flag points to urgent data within the TCP segment that requires immediate attention from the receiving application, and it allows for the transmission of time-sensitive or high-priority data. The acknowledgement flag acknowledges the receipt of data from the other party, and it confirms the successful delivery of previously received packets and helps ensure reliable data transmission by acknowledging the sequence number of the next expected byte. The push flag is used to request the receiving application to process and deliver data immediately. It instructs the receiver to forward the data to the application layer for immediate processing rather than trying to optimize the transmission for efficiency through buffering. The reset flag is utilized to reset a TCP connection and clear any existing connections. It's sent to terminate an abnormal or problematic connection and used when a host encounters an error and wants to abruptly terminate the connection due to unforeseen circumstances. The synchronized flag is used during the TCP handshake process to synchronize the sequence numbers between the sender and the receiver. The send flag is set in the first packet of the TCP handshake to initiate communication. The finish flag indicates that the sender has finished sending data and wants to close the TCP connection. It's used during the TCP connection termination process to initiate a graceful closing of the connection. The connection is fully closed when both parties have sent and received FIN packets. The window size indicates the number of bytes that the receiver is willing to accept before requiring an acknowledgement, and it helps regulate the flow of data between the sender and the receiver. The checksum is used to detect errors in the TCP segment during transmission and ensures the integrity of the data by verifying the accuracy of the received segment. The urgent pointer points to urgent data within the TCP segment, and it informs the receiving host about any time-sensitive or high-priority data that requires immediate attention. The options header provides additional functionality or options for TCP communication. Common options include maximum segment size, timestamps, and window scaling. These options enhance the performance, efficiency, and reliability of TCP communication. 
In terms of similarities, both TCP and UDP create a header that goes after the IP header, and both keep track of individual sessions of the same application by using source and destination port numbers. And port numbers are logical entities used by applications to bind transport sessions. These port numbers are created or destroyed based upon the needs of an application. Every TCP segment and UDP datagram has a source and a destination port. The destination port is typically a well-known registered application port, and the source port is randomly derived. And these ports are separated into three different ranges. We have the common well-known services from 0 to 1023, and then we have the registered services from the IANA, which is 1024 to 49,151. And then we have the dynamic ports that can be used for any purpose, which are typically called ephemeral ports. And both of these protocols leverage port numbers to perform multiplexing. So let's talk about how port numbers work so that we can better understand this concept of multiplexing. Let's say that we're going on our computer and we're going to open up a web browser. And we're going to google.com because we want to research something on the internet. However, for one reason or another, we're not just opening one tab to google.com. We're opening multiple tabs to google.com. Maybe we're watching a video in one, we're doing active research on another, checking email on the other, whatever the case may be, it doesn't really matter. We just had these three tabs open. So when we talk about communication in terms of ports and protocols, we have a source IP, a destination IP, and a source port and a destination port. This is called a four tuple. That makes up your communication between two different endpoints. So on our computer, let's just say this computer has a IP of 1.1.1.1, and we're going to communicate with a server, which is an IP of 2.2.2.2. And when we communicate with that server, we're going to do so not just on an IP basis, but at a higher level protocol basis on specific ports. So if this was a web server and it's hosting, say, web traffic on port 443, when we communicate with that server, for every individual tab that we have here. We're going to be doing so on this port 443. So we have three pieces of the equation already. We have the source IP, we have the destination IP, and we also have the destination port right here. However, what's the source port going to be? Now we went over before that there's such a thing as ephemeral ports, and these ports are created and destroyed as needed by the host system so that traffic can be forwarded out that system to the destination. And this is where we start getting into multiplexing. So multiplexing is where there's multiple instances of the same application running on a host, and it allows a host to keep track of those individual sessions by using port numbers. So in this case, if we know that our source and our destination IPs are here and we have our destination port as well. We just have to now solve for what the source port is going to be. And we spoke about before how that falls within a certain range. So we'll say that, for example, the first tab right here is 50,001. And we'll say that the second tab is 50,100. And the third tab will be 50,200. So those are the three source ports that we're going to use. And as the browser is communicating with the server, these are the different ports that are used for those browser connections. It forms a socket. And when this communication occurs, there's a unique combination of the source and destination IP and the source and destination port number that allows the host to segment these three different browsing communications. So as we're communicating, say on this tab right here, say that this is using 50,200 for its source. When the server is responding back to that browser, it's going to set its source as port 443 because it's a web server, it's hosting that port. However, the destination is going to be 50,200 for the destination port so that when your computer receives that packet, it sees that the IP, the destination IP is 1.1.1.1 because that is owned by that computer. And when 
it takes a look at the upper layer data, it's then going to see that the destination port is 50,200, which means it has to be sent to this browser right here, this browser tab, instead of one of the other browser tabs. And this is true for the other scenarios as well. So that if we were communicating back to this browser tab, the destination IP, the destination port would be set to 50,100 to make sure that the data got sent here and it did not get sent over here. In terms of differences, UDP is connectionless. It does not verify the existence of the destination host. It does not confirm that the destination is ready to receive data, and it does not validate that data that's been sent has been received. There is no reliability or retransmission that's offered with UDP. TCP, on the other hand, is connection-oriented. It validates the existence of the peer prior to sending data. It negotiates parameters with the peer to control the exchange of data. The data that is exchanged is done so reliably using sequence numbers, acknowledgments, flow control, and retransmissions, and it can gracefully inform a peer of the need to close a connection. TCP can also work with any format of data, including constant streams of data from an upper layer protocol. If you have any questions about what was covered, please leave a comment below. And if you enjoy these tutorials and want to support my work, please like this video and share it with others. If you have the means, you can contribute to my Patreon or leave a tip in my jar. Be sure to subscribe to stay updated with my latest content, and thank you all for watching.